So welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for joining us on this uh, January meetup of Continual AI. So this month we are talking about uh, reassure free continual learning. So how we can uh, learn continually without uh, replaying uh, old patterns, without replaying uh, uh, representations. Uh, and so I think this is going to be a, quite an interesting meeting. And this is the lineup for today. Uh, first, we have uh, Vincenzo Lomonaco from University of Bologna, who will talk about uh, his paper, Real Share Free Continual Learning over Small Non-IID Batches. Then we will have Gala Sokar from Eindhoven University. And uh, the paper is SpaceNet, Make Free Space for Continual Learning. The third in the line is Christopher Cannon from Rochester Institute of Technology uh, with his paper of Explorations in Replay-Free Online Continual Learning. And uh, finally, Eden Beluda from Universi uh, University of Paris-Saclay with uh, reaction free class incremental learning for image classification. So uh, the, the talks will be uh, short enough to, to guarantee questions. We can, I guess, ask one short question uh, or two at the end of each talk, and then we will have a final, uh, um, let's say, longer uh, question uh, space uh, after all the four talks. So feel free to use the chat if you want to, to interact or unmute yourself or raise your hand, whatever you, you prefer. And um, I will leave now the stage to Vincenzo Lomonaco for his Russia free uh, paper, paper. So please, Vincenzo, I'm going to, to stop my screen sharing and let you uh, on stage. All right, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, you should be able to see my first slide and hear yeah. me well. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea, for uh, the kind presentation. Um, I will take the uh, honor uh, <laughs> to uh, present also a bit uh, the topic, actually, because I, I, I created this uh, presentation um, on the fly, and I'm sorry for that, uh, but uh, I was trying uh, to somehow characterize the vision behind also this paper uh, for which you can hide all the details um, uh, in uh, I mean the, the actual paper, which is uh, already published uh, on archive. And uh, so you can find also the code related to this paper, uh, the cafe version, uh, the ones that actually uh, supporting the experiments uh, reported in the paper, and then also the re-implementation in ByTorch. Of course, all these, these slides will be uploaded later on our Slack platform and the, on the forum. Uh, so let's start with uh, the ideas behind the paper, and also in general, uh, I think may be useful to consider when talking about VR shell free continual learning, but also uh, on experience replay in general for continual learning. So. And I think that uh, what we know up to date is that uh, replay works extreme, extremely well in practice. And, that, and uh, sometimes even like one or five percent of the entire training set that we encounter uh, over the entire uh, training phase uh, is enough to provide us with a, a very good accuracy somehow compared with the offline, let's say, joint training strategies. And uh, but what we know also is that raw data replay is very, very inefficient and is likely to be unsustainable um, to in the long term. Uh, and also what we know is that it may be also biological implausible uh, in the sense that it's very difficult to think of a, a biological learning systems that actually stores uh, raw data uh, information to the brains to be recovered. And what uh, I mean, many neuroscientists, for example, think is that we, we, we do use some replay, but it's mostly concerned with high level uh, abstract uh, representations or, or uh, that are extremely low dimensional and are uh, linked to more, um, let's say, reasoning process rather than on, on pure VR shell based um, uh, mechanism. And uh, there are also very interesting ideas about on, on the 
uh, even counterintuitive uh, and destructive uh, essence of replay um, that I, I would like to discuss with you all uh, maybe afterwards in the uh, panel discussion, let's say. Uh, so first of all, that replay may be uh, an overkill because replay is actually naturally occurring from the environment itself. And also that replay may be even harmful uh, and destructive because it actually destroys the data sequentiality semantics, right? So the, the fact that the world is replaying itself in a certain way, it, it may help us actually to uh, remove what is biased uh, and we what's the biased information that we come up over learning and then also, uh, you know, uh, hints us to, to something that uh, since it is naturally reoccurring, it means it is actually important to, to preserve instead. And replay may destroy all these kind of, of semantic because essentially we try to, to keep um, everything into our memory without erasing actually anything. And I mean, this is something that I think would be like uh, very important for the future of continual learning because we, we have to integrate actually forgetting. Forgetting is not something that is uh, to be considered as something just harmful, but it's also essential, as we know, uh, to be true for uh, biological learning systems. And uh, so um, all the experiments and, and the ideas that I'm going to present here today are based on, on the, on the Code 50 dataset, which we believe uh, it is natural enough to covering, you know, some interesting aspects of continual learning, like such as uh, video sequences and natural video sequences, as well as being like reasonable enough in terms of a dimension to prototype new continual learning strategies. And here we are in a, a scenario in which we have a number of incremental steps, or let's call them steps, uh, to avoid confusions. And the basic only assumptions here is that, uh, we, well, there is no notion of tasks or multiple tasks. We just encounter these steps and we assume that for each step we have we have uh, different data that we, uh, we don't encounter uh, again in all these uh, different steps. So the data contained in these steps are unique. And we may encounter examples belonging to classes you already seen before, classes uh, we've never seen or both of them. It's uh, our methods should be agnostic to this kind of definition. And what we should push actually uh, forward is the idea that uh, we can encounter a lot of these different steps over time like hundreds of them, not just a dozen of, of well-contained, well-separated tasks. And so this is what we did actually, on, based on the idea that we don't want to use replay, we wanted to, to actually see if it was possible to learn continually over small and ID batches. So taken for very small videos, so highly correlated images, and see if we can learn uh, over time over these uh, hundreds of different batches or different steps. And so we did that uh, by uh, creating uh, three different scenarios of incremental difficulty, starting from uh, the first one, uh, which is um, uh, composed of 79 in incremental steps, and uh, another one with 196 incremental steps, and another one, the most difficult one, with 391 incremental steps, where we have for each of them just 300 images of one class, uh, just a short video of an object smoothly moving in front of the camera. And as you can see, I mean, uh, a lot of different strategies not involving replay are really finding this particular scenario of, uh, you know, very difficult. Uh, in fact, they are, are not able to learn continuous at all. And it is uh, what we see instead that uh, our own technique, you can find all the details about this in the paper, is kind of one of the few approaches uh, that can actually work in this very challenging scenario. And, and still being able to grow uh, over time uh, with a constant memory and computation, but with a linear, let's say, growth uh, as we were, um, encounter more data over time uh, in terms of, uh, of accuracy. And here I report also some of the other metrics in terms of uh, efficiency. So we can see here the, the strategy here, one star here, is running uh, counting also testing actually in uh, just uh, under 40 minutes uh, and it, it actually uses just 12 megabytes of overhead, which is again constant and fixed across uh, the world. Training is, is not dependent on the number of batches we encounter. And uh, just to quickly conclude, I'm not sure how, how much time I have left, but um, I wanted to show you uh, the scalability of AR1 
uh, on uh, other initial experiments we are carrying out. It's not present in the paper, but it's something we are actually working on to see if actually this real free strategy can scale also on, on complex data sets such as ImageNet uh, 1000. And this is uh, a picture taken from this paper, Genetic Feature Replay for Plus Incremental Learning of Liu et al. 2020. And you can see here there are a number of uh, baselines uh, tried on this uh, very complex uh, benchmark. I'm sure Chris knows uh, this well, uh, but essentially it's based on uh, a first initial batch of a 500 classes and then 25 incremental batches of 12, uh, 20 classes each. And here we can see that, uh, I mean, there are, there's this uh, awesome uh, strategy uh, of Liu that is actually working very well. It is reaching like 54 percentage accuracy uh, with a replay of 20K images. So 20 images per class. And here are the results for the Air One uh, strategy with a bit of replay uh, of 20K as well. So in line with the previous approaches we said before and the CWR, which is like a strategy on which uh, Air One is based on uh, with no replay at all. And we can see that both of them, uh, well, it's, it's a very ugly plot, but you can, I will, you trust myself, trust me that uh, uh, essentially you can reach like an accuracy level that, which is better than, uh, than the actual red curve here. So we are excited about this. We are going to uh, hopefully publish, publish something about this soon. But essentially what's interesting to see is that not only we can cap up the, the actual results of these techniques, but we can do that in uh, much less time. So for example, for rebalance, it takes uh, around 17 hours to complete. For Air One uh, Plus Replay as well, it, it takes like about uh, two and a half hours. And for CWR, just one hour. So uh, I wanted to conclude my uh, short talk just by uh, saying that maybe, I mean, the question is not if we can uh, achieve good results without replay, because I think that and as you will see with the next uh, uh, presentations, I think we can actually learn continually in even complex situations without replay at all. But the question is uh, rather uh, if we can learn continually in these very difficult situations with small and ID batches, with high dimensional data, without replay and without a pre-trained feature extractor. Because it seems that the difficult part here is to learn continuity the representation. And I mean, this is uh, something that is up to debate. I mean, um, it's in, uh, unclear if, for example, biological learning systems, they use like uh, something pre-tabulated into our brain uh, that can help, you know, structure uh, further learning. But uh, essentially what we can see from our experiments is that it's very, very difficult to build this representation over time if we encounter these kind of uh, scenarios uh, with small batches and, and in very high dimensional uh, uh, real world settings. So thank you so much for your attention and free to, to accept your, your questions. And also we can expand these uh, ideas in the, in the uh, Q&A sessions we are gonna have later. Thank you, Vincenzo, thank you so much. Um, so I, I, ju I just have an observation, maybe, uh, before letting uh, others ask questions if they if they want to. So um, yeah, I, I was wondering also about the pre-training uh, part because I mean I, I know part of your of your mod of your strategy. So yeah, AR1 and CWR are based on a um, let's say pre-trained convolution convolutional network, and I. I think that uh, in order to avoid to have pre-trained model, it will be necessary to move uh, from the current uh, task-based continual learning, you know, in which you have a, a sequence of tasks. Because if you have tasks with very uh, small number of patterns, it's very difficult to learn uh, up to the point in which you are able to generalize to new examples, so to learn effectively because currently you need many, many patterns. So either we use models which learn fast, faster than uh, they currently learn, or we uh, allow for repetitive exposure of patterns. So in yeah. a realistic environment, I mean, you, you, will be uh, you will see patterns over and over again. 
And if you don't, maybe those patterns aren't very interesting. So you can also forget those patterns. And so this, uh, <laughs> this is a very complex environment on which to test our strategies, but I think this is uh, also a very good place to, to move for, for also your, uh, your approach. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, this was just, uh, just an observation. So if any other has questions on, uh, maybe Vincenzo can talk a bit more about his uh, strategy in the, in the Q&A. So I, I see uh, uh, an end raised. So Chris, please go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if you tried any other, uh, um, uh, for initializing, you, say you used 500, 500 classes, right? At least in our own yeah. work, we've, 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 you know, we did this uh, exhaustive study looking at different, uh, different state-of-the-art methods, right? And we actually found that some would totally flip depending on the size of that data set. Like, like if you did a hot, if you, if you initialize on 100, then this one's a state-of-the-art. But of course, in the papers, they only test one. And the, this other method, if you initialize on 500, whoa, it works better than that other method. But if you only initialize on 100, it works terribly, or at least significantly worse. So I was just wondering if you looked at that as a. I know it takes a long time to train on ImageNet, yeah. but 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 if you if you considered like doing any studies looking at performance as a function of the size of that initialization. Uh, absolutely, Chris. This is a fundamental question uh, that brings up uh, one of the latest points that I mentioned. So the fact that. Uh, for me, it's pretty clear that there are many techniques that can work very, very well in very complex situations, but starting from a very good pre-trained model or from a very big initial batch. Uh, then we try, for example, to uh, this, I mean, uh, the techniques we propose are some of these techniques that can work well in that case. But uh, as we try our own technique, for example, on, uh, um, let's say, an initial batch, which is not uh, representative enough somehow of the uh, distribution that we would like to take off, um, then uh, it's, it becomes very, very difficult to, to, to make them work well um, on the wall, let's say, training sequence. Uh, so, yeah, for me, that's, that's another question. If we can uh, find uh, a way to also learn the representation somehow uh, and, and, and so work also in, in situations in which the initial batch is not that big, um, without replay, of course. And uh, what I was thinking is that uh, an interesting venue of, of future research is that is to somehow work on unsupervised continuous learning for the for the representation level of the network, and then uh, that would somehow be continuously trained on a on a level on a level of video sequences. And if you can, if you can find a way to do that, then uh, essentially the features, uh, robust features will, will natural ar naturally arise. And then you can use other techniques like the weight isolation techniques that can be like uh, used on top of these robust representation uh, as we do actually now uh, to, to, to work also in very complex uh, scenarios like with the small uh, ID batches and, and, and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's still an open question how we can build that representation. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for also for the question. So I guess we can move on now and then we we will see if uh, Vincenzo got any question in the in the Q&A session. Uh, so now we have Gada Sokar with uh, SpaceNet. So please feel free to, to share your screen and uh, uh, speak. Okay, we can see we can see the screen. But uh, you are muted. Okay. Yeah. Now we can. Can you hear you. me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, very good. So, uh, hello everyone. Thanks, Andrea, for uh, the introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Reda Sukkar. I'm a PhD student at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Uh, today, I'm pleased to be here to present uh, my recent work, SpaceNet Make a Free Space for Continual Learning. This work has been accepted in the Neurocomputing Journal. So uh, let's start by the difference between the continual learning paradigm and the classical supervised learning. So assume we have a neural network here. In the classical supervised learning, uh, the neural network weights are, are learned using 
a training data of a set of classes. Then after we finalize the training of on, the, on this set of classes, the learning model is used to predict new samples from the same classes that we have seen during the training phase. However, in the, conti the continual learning paradigm, after this point in time, the model continue to encounter new tasks sequentially, and each task presents a new set of classes. The model has to update its weights to accommodate for the newly added classes. So what's the challenge in this learning paradigm, which is the class incremental learning scenario in the continual learning? Let's, at, let's look at this point in time after we have seen uh, three tasks. If we present this image to the model, which come from the tasks that we have just learned, the model can easily predict the correct class. However, if we present these samples, which came from the first task that was learned a while ago, unfortunately, the model fails to identify these samples and it tends to forget the previously learned tasks. This phenomena, as you probably know, is well known as catastrophic forgetting. So why does the network forget? Let's look again at the continual learning scenario. When task two arrive, it's used all the available capacity to learn the new classes. So all the network parameters are devoted to learn these new tasks, these new classes. It ignores the fact that there were tasks came before it, and it also doesn't account for the tasks that might come in the future. Now the question is, does the task really need the full capacity of the network to learn the new classes? Uh, luckily, the answer is uh, no. A previous study showed that the neural network are overparameterized, which means that many connections in the network are redundant. In addition, uh, an interesting work proposed in uh, 2018 by Mukano et al. Uh, they uh, dynamically train sparse neural network from scratch, and they showed that it can perform the same uh, they have the same performance of dense neural network. This idea is nowadays uh, known as adaptive sparse training, and it's called adaptive because the sparse topology is adaptively changed during the training procedure. And this is uh, different from the static sparse training in which we have a sparse connection allocated at the beginning of the training, and these connections are kept fixed during the whole process. So uh, here I'm uh, presenting uh, some results from uh, the two earliest work from uh, this direction. Uh, for sure, there are uh, many more recent work, maybe uh, with better performance, but I want to show uh, you here uh, some idea and intuition about the performance of this adaptive sparse training um, message. So uh, here is uh, the results on uh, ImageNet using the dance model of ResNet 50. And as you can see here, using the sparse training with 20% of the connection or even 10% of the connection, we can achieve a performance which is very close to the dance model. So the first key message here is that we can reduce the number of parameters of the network by around 90% without losing the accuracy or the performance. The second question is that how does the brain process the information? So is the representation in the brain is dense? Uh, also the answer is uh, no. Uh, here uh, is uh, some interesting observations from uh, neuroscience. They observe that the information in the brain is stored in a sparse and distributed way and at any point in time, only very few neurons are active. So the second message today is that the brain is so efficient, even though the activity of the neurons is highly sparse. Uh, here uh, comes SpaceNet, which is inspired by these two key messages. So let's discuss uh, the details of the message. As the first key, a key idea of SpaceNet is to allocate sparse connection for each task. 
So uh, let's discuss the same example. When task two arrives, instead of using the whole capacity of the network or the dense network, we allocate sparse connection in each layer. Moreover, we account for the previous tasks. How, when we allocating this sparse connection, we avoid allocating this connection on the important neuron reserved for the previous tasks. And I will explain in the second how we get these important neurons. So this is the first key idea, allocate sparse connection for each task. The second key idea is to train each task using adaptive sparse training. So let's take an example when task two arrive, the connection for task one or various tasks is kept fixed. And then as we explained, we allocate sparse connection for this task. Then we train this task using sparse training. In this sparse training method, we compact the sparse connection in the most important neurons for this task. So it will result in sparse representation for each task and it will also make a free space for future tasks. Uh, the time is limited to go through the details of the our proposed sparse training algorithm. Please check it out in the paper and if you have any question, feel free to ask us afterwards. But I want to uh, give you an idea how this sparse training algorithm will result in redistributing the connection in the important neurons. So let's uh, look at this benchmark, split amnest, which is a commonly used one in the class incremental scenario so far. Uh, this benchmark consists of uh, five tasks. Each task contains uh, two consecutive classes of uh, amnest. And uh, we show here as uh, the input neurons, which is a uh, 28 by 28. And uh, when uh, task one arrives, we allocate sparse connections for uh, this task. Uh, here in this case, we are talking about the first layer. So we uniformly distributed the connection on the input neurons. And after the sparse training, the connections are redistributed in the important neurons. Here in this case, it is distributed in the locations where uh, it ad identifies the digits 0 and 1. Similarly, when task 5 arrives, the connections are allocated, are reallocated in the digits that represent an, uh, 8 and 9. So it seems interesting, right? Uh, how about the performance? Uh, so we compared our methods to uh, the regularization based method, which tried to uh, mitigate the forgetting problem by constraining the change in the important weights of previous tasks. We also compared our uh, method to the rehearsal based methods, which uh, replace the data of previous tasks along with the data of the current task, so as not to forget it. And uh, here a space net, which we consider it as an architecture based method. Uh, as you can see here, the performance of space net is much better than the regularization based method in the class incremental learning scenario and is closer to the rehearsal one, which is interesting since space net is only based on this sparse representation idea and doesn't use any of the previous task data. And it's also much efficient in terms of computation and memory if we compare it with the rehearsal based methods. Uh, however, it is a bit out of the scope of our paper, but we also uh, tried a small experiment where we test our method with the rehearsal uh, in combining it with the replay based method or rehearsal based method. And as you can see here, we achieved a better performance by combining this sparse representation with the replay uh, data. Uh, and the, the last thing I want to uh, discuss here is the uh, role of the sparse representation in mitigating the forgetting problem. Uh, so uh, to study this point, we compare our method to uh, this baseline, which uh, we call the static sparse neural network. In this baseline, 
uh, we allocate sparse connection for each task, but we didn't perform this sparse training algorithm. So the connection is kept fixed during the whole training. And as you can see, SpaceNet also outperform this baseline by a big margin. So let's uh, look at uh, more complex input. Uh, so here uh, I'm presenting uh, CIFAR 10100 benchmark, uh, which contain a natural image. This benchmark consists of uh, six tasks. The first task contains a uh, full data set of CIFAR 10, and each uh, of the other tasks contains 10 classes of CIFAR 100. As this experiment is performed uh, using a very small uh, architecture of convolution neural network. Uh, and uh, here is the results on each of the six tasks after training the whole sequence of tasks, along with the average accuracy on all uh, the tasks. Uh, and as you can see here, um, clearly the, the problem that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation where most of the methods have a very good performance on the last task. However, it totally forget some of the earlier task. However, SpaceNet try to utilize the available capacity. In this case, this a small neural network between all the tasks. So the performance on all the tasks are close to each other. Uh, I want to uh, conclude this uh, talk by some characteristics of SpaceNet and also some of the open questions and uh, future work. Uh, so uh, let's uh, discuss the characteristics first. So SpaceNet is a rehearsal free method, which means that when we uh, train a new task, we didn't replace the data of all tasks. The second point is that uh, SpaceNet aim to utilize the available capacity first uh, instead of expanding the model with each newly added task. The third point is uh, in this uh, work, we target the task agnostic inference, which means that when we present an image to the model, we have no idea from where this image, from which task this image came from. And as we discussed, SpaceNet account for previous tasks. So, so we aim to produce sparse representation to reduce the interference and the forgetting uh, for previous tasks. And we also account for future tasks. So when we learn each task, we try to learn it in a compact space so as to leave room for future tasks. Uh, so uh, finally, here are uh, some open question and uh, future work. So in the future, we want to uh, test SpaceNet on larger sequence of tasks. And uh, also um, another two important questions that uh, we want to arise is that, is it possible to allow for pos uh, positive backward transfer as well? Because as I explained, uh, the connections for previous uh, tasks are kept fixed when we encounter new tasks and some neurons are uh, are reserved. So somehow uh, in this work we limit the positive backward transfer. So how we can uh, address this point as well. And uh, the last question that uh, I want to uh, address in the near future is can we uh, use the previously allocated connection instead of allocating new connections for each task based, for example, on the task similarity? So if two tasks are similar to each other, can I use the previous learned connection instead of allocating uh, new uh, ones? Thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, uh, the rebrand version of our paper is uh, available on archive. And if you have uh, any further question, please feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I would have many, many questions, but <laughs> yeah. I'm going to. Uh, yeah, please uh, to answer. To, 
yeah to, to stick only with uh, with one well i was very impressed that uh, also the the fix the network uh the fix the sparse network obtained uh, such good results uh, at least on uh, on, on split amnist and th this is in some sense comforting because also the 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 main uh, uh theoretical trend of continual learning uh, also french uh, at the beginning uh, of time so exactly. which said that uh, disentangling the the representation is useful well at least we have uh, also uh, with uh, some other older proofs we have uh, another proof that this is uh, really true so sparsity helps in mitigating forgetting this is a uh, good news and something i am very excited about maybe the the counter uh, the other side of the coin is that uh, is is currently is not easy to to make uh, sparse approaches uh, with uh, with current uh, frameworks and also GPUs are not very uh, friendly with sparse connections but I mean the the, the idea is uh, I think is promising so tools will will arrive will come and they are also there are already some uh, some hints in this direction. And uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your, yes, your talk. I, I really liked uh, your approach. Yes, thank you. Okay, let me see. Vincenzo, maybe you want to, to add something or to ask something? Oh, yeah, um, I want to ask a quick question to Sodor about, about their method. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I, maybe I missed that in your presentation. Sorry uh, if that's the case. But, um, I uh, wanted to know, especially, for example, for the Sci4 experiments, uh, yeah. so have you tried to measure uh, the amount of uh, space uh, that, uh, num in terms of number of uh, uh, weights or neurons that um, your method needs to learn uh, each, each new task so that reasonably you can come up with an idea of how much uh, or at least how many tasks can uh, your method process before ending up in a, over, let's say, saturation, reach the capacity of the network? Yeah, yeah, uh, very good question, thank you. Uh, yes, we uh, analyzed this point, actually, as I mentioned in the presentation, in this experiment, we use a very small uh, architecture of convolution neural network. So uh, each task in this case uh, used 10% of the connections. Yeah. And, but as you said, we found that it is not enough in this case, for example, to, uh, to handle, uh, as you see in the presentation, the, the accuracy on each task is not still satisfactory. Uh, and uh, we also, you can find in the paper itself, we uh, did the same experiment using a, a ResNet architecture, and we can achieve a better performance uh, using this larger one. But still the uh, amount of weights that you need are kind of 10%, even though in that case you have a bigger model. Uh, a little bit bigger in this case. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we have uh, any other questions? Eden, please, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, if if I'm not wrong, there are two works uh, whose name is uh, Piggyback and Packnet, uh, who of, uh, that uh, try the same uh, technique than you is to compress the neural networks and define the most relevant weights in uh, in order to learn the new classes with uh, with the freed weights. Did you try to compare with these approaches or not? Uh, I didn't, uh, but I have a reason for that uh, because these approaches uh, depend on uh, the fact that uh, the task identity is available during the interference. So they marked the connections for each task. But here in SpaceNet, we try to uh, address a task agnostic scenario where we, we, we don't have any idea about uh, which connections related with, with which uh, task. Thank you. And also, and also, Soccer, you did not start uh, from a pre-trained model, right? Because no. these other methods, yeah, exactly. So these other methods, they rely on a backbone, let's say, architecture. Yeah, I think yeah. she's pre-trained. Yeah, uh, here I start uh, with a sparse network from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, I guess we can uh, we can move on. Well, I should say that we are perfectly on time, even if a presenter is never supposed to, to say that. 
but I'm, I know that the next speaker will not take advantage of this. <laughs> so, <laughs> Christopher, please, uh, please go ahead with your explorations in replay free online continual learning. All right, uh, let me share here. All right, hopefully you guys can see the screen. Um, so thank you for inviting me to give a presentation. Um, this isn't really a part of particular paper. Yeah, whenever I was asked to give a talk about replay free uh, learning, so continual learning. So uh, I'm going to present some of our work in this space and also give some thoughts. Um, but maybe actually just first kind of stay my philosophy. So. So my group is working on a particular branch of continual learning, and this is the right way I think to do it. So what we work on is online. Really, really it's just online learning, right? The old classical online learning, but but from non-IID, non-stationary data streams. So what does that mean? Just to make it clear, no looping over giant batches. So not like here's here's you know we see a lot of papers on the like ImageNet, and they're like here's a hundred thousand examples. Learn that. That's a that's a that's continual learning. Now learn the next batch of hundred thousand examples. That kind of defeats the purpose to me. Um, uh, no task labels. Uh, we're not using them during training or inference. They're not often available during inference. Uh, and uh, as the last talk kind of justified, uh, not using them there. Um, but we haven't really been using them either during training. Um, brain inspired motivation. So I have a lot of training for whatever reason during my PhD in computational neuroscience. And so I still take a lot of inspiration from this because the brain, we do online continual learning, right? So there's, we should be able to pull in those mechanisms to take inspiration from them to try to enable these things. And then lastly, uh, another part of my philosophy is to test algorithms on large scale high resolution data sets. So, I mean, we see a lot of work in this space on things like permuted MNIST still, or split MNIST and stuff like that. I think these are great sanity tests, but they're not really sufficient. We've tested many, many methods in my group and have shown that methods that work well on these small data sets just don't translate, like a lot of times. I mean, either they, either tra it, there's no guarantee that that will happen. And ideally test on video streams. I really, really, really like like the, like video streams because again, that's how we humans experience the world, right? So, uh, but today here I'm going to talk about replay free online continual learning. But just to kind of like set the set this streaming learning idea, or really just online online learning from non IID data up, um, your batch size is one. So that's that's all there is to really say about that. None of this big batches and looping over them or anything like that. We just See an example, learn. See an example, learn. See an example, learn, etc. Um, okay, so so uh, Vincenzo already kind of covered this, but so a little bit of this is redundant. But replay is the easy hack, right? It's the easy hack to prevent catastrophic forgetting. It works great. Uh, get new examples, add them to a buffer. If buffer is full, some policy for removing samples, or maybe your maybe your buffer is practically infinite. Who knows? It varies a lot in between papers the size of this buffer. Mix the new samples in with some randomly selected samples. Do some updates with some back with backprop. Just fine tune this network with some stuff chosen from your buffer and some new stuff. Great. Um, and and we showed in this uh, um, ICRA 2019 paper that if you gave your buffer unlimited capacity, you can capture 99% of the offline learner's performance. But as Vincenzo was mentioning earlier, you don't need to use uh, an unlimited capacity to still do extremely, extremely, extremely well. Just a very small fraction will still let you recover a lot of the performance. So why does replay work? So it resembles IID training due to mixing of old samples in and shuffling, which is necessary for using conventional gradient descent, and this helps maintain the stability during training. So to learn, we have to change our weights, but learning means old stuff can be erased, uh, and replay helps ensure that those old patterns won't get completely eradicated. But replay is not ideal. Uh, it's not efficient in terms of memory or compute. It's not scalable, and you can't really learn in a resource constrained setting if all you are depending on is replay to do this. But I'm not opposed to replay. I have papers using replay, multiple papers using replay. I will share one that doesn't use it a little bit. But the brain does replay, right? We know our brains do replay. 
not the same way as implanted in the networks, as I'll mention in a moment, but, but this is very well studied. For over 20 years, we have overwhelming evidence the brain does replay, and that replay plays a role in memory consolidation. Um, we know the hippocampus can, can store information very rapidly, and we know replay occurs during slow wave sleep, in which that information appears to be transferred to the neocortex, and if you disrupt slow wave sleep, you disrupt memory consolidation. Um, and it even is, re re the replay is really neat during sleep when it occurs, and that it occurs in a compressed time scale. So again, overwhelming evidence for this. This is from this paper from 2007. Um, where they were recording from these mice. You can see like the same um, pattern of neurons are firing, but just in a very compressed, um, uh, in a compressed time, time length. And, and people have been thinking about this for a long time. This is a paper by Randy O'Reilly that was published in Cognitive Science in 2014, and just going over how this, how this might occur in, in his theory, where the hippocampus is acquiring compressed representations uh, and storing them away. And then during slow wave sleep, these are reactivated in order to train um, the, the neocortex so that it can uh, learn those patterns that are stored short term in the hippocampus. Um, so, so replay does happen in the brain, but there are critical differences between what the brain does and the way most people implement this stuff. So. Recently acquired information is stored. It's not 100% clear yet, I think. I don't think nobody's 100% sure, but there is evidence that it's basically erasing itself at some point, right? That that it's not it's not it's not a buffer of everything you ever you ever experienced. It's recent stuff, and then that recent stuff is gradually um, eroded. Now, it maybe it is true. This is the part that's unclear. Right, as as Vincenzo mentioned, maybe just only a fraction of the data is necessary for replay. So maybe it is storing one or two percent of old stuff that's not getting eradicated, but that's really hard to tell. What we do know is recent experience is more replayed. Um, but also, uh, the hippocampus does not store vertical representations; it stores uh, compressed ones, so very high-level information. Um, um, like, for example, from it receives information from from like V4, for instance, not from our photoreceptors. Uh, yeah, so, so I already said this. The brain does not do ver vertical replay. We actually had a paper in, in uh, ECCV this year done with my student Tyler Hayes, uh, and Kushal Coffley, and uh, uh, Robert Tressa and uh, Mano Manoja Chara, so a bunch of my bunch of my students. It was it was our biggest lab collaboration ever. Uh, when we built this system called Remind, it uses replay, but from compressed representations rather than kind of like you, you find a lot of there's a lot of papers, at least in the computer vision community. They're all like, here's a new twist on iCarl. Here's another new twist on iCarl. This is something kind of different that we were trying to do. Um, yeah, and the brain can obviously not just doesn't just use replay, right? We we uh, we can acquire information very quickly, and so replay it, it, it is not the only mechanism we have for learning things, of course. So, okay, so that's just to set up saying I, I'm not I'm not necessarily opposed to replay, but uh, why replay free learning is hard? Well, we have the stability plasticity dilemma, which I alluded to earlier. To learn, weights must change. Changing weights causes old net knowledge to be lost. So, how do we address this? Um, well. Here's a really simple idea. Uh, keep hidden representations fixed and use some streaming learner where all the outputs are independent and guaranteed not to interfere with each other. Great. So uh, this, this, uh, we can do that with linear discriminant analysis. And so that's exactly what we did. But before we go there, maybe we can just think about just properties of old school algorithms that we all learned in in intro to ML that might have these properties. Actually, probably no linear R map. But uh, um, uh, it was very popular in the 90s. Uh, so incremental nearest neighbor, perfect. That one's not going to start from catastrophic forgetting. It's just non-parametric. It's just a big buffer, right? Uh, just add new examples. You have, you, you have unlimited memory use. Um, we tried to create a more efficient kind of version of this uh, and that used replay in extreme. Um, Art map. So art map is again, if you're not familiar with it, basically a non-parametric model that is a lot like incremental nearest neighbor, but tries to do some smart merging of units. No catastrophic forgetting, 
uh, no need for replay, but it can't learn any representations, no feature learning, same with nearest neighbor, right? It's just a very shallow non-parametric network. Uh, incremental quadratic discriminant analysis, that's another method you could use to do this. It won't have catastrophic forgetting, uh, but but again, no feature learning, so I can't really do that. And lastly, the one we'll play with here in a moment is incremental linear discriminant analysis. So it's a parametric shallow linear network, just an output layer and a covariance matrix. And it avoids catastrophic forgetting because classes don't really interfere with each other, but it may not capture some rare examples as well. So it's not a perfect algorithm, but let's just try it out. Let's see how well it does. It's easy. So that's what we did. Um, so, so LDA, so before we go there, if you just look at the learning rules for LDA, you'll see it should be largely immune to the order of the data presented and only needs one pass through a data set. So just for the offline version of the algorithm, you compute the mean of each class's features, right? And so now if you just replace that with a running mean, great, now you're streaming learning. And then you have a shared covariance matrix across all the classes. And so you can just have an efficient update rule for updating that covariance matrix over time. And boom, you now have incremental LDA. And I wasn't the first to realize this. Like I was just thinking about it and I was like, wait, that shouldn't, that should be invariant to the sequence order. And, and then I Googled it and surely enough, the data mining community had already been using it for stuff um, with incremental LDA for their kind of problems. But nobody really combined it uh, for with uh, CNN features and done something for like modern deep learning applications. So how do we do it? Well, uh, kind of similar to what Vincenzo was mentioning earlier. Again, let's uh, let's bootstrap the system with the CNN. So we're going to have a pre-trained deep CNN uh, after the widely used. Uh, uh, and we're going to use, well, I think I deleted the sentence there somehow on accident. So we use ResNet 18, which is widely used in continual learning with images. And um, for example, all the iCarl family methods. And we initialize it on, uh, I think something's got cut off. We initialize it on 100 classes. So just 100 classes of the total uh, 1,000 categories in ImageNet. We have we update a class specific running mean vector and we have a shared covariance uh, matrix. And so both of those we just use online updates for for the, the you know the incremental running mean and then we have an, uh, a similar approach to updating the covariance matrix over time. And during inference, a prediction is made by assigning the label of the closest uh, the closest um, 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 prototype uh, using the class mean vectors and the covariance matrix. So. Nothing particularly, uh, I, I can answer questions about it. We also have, have a paper that was published in um, the Continual Learning um, for Vision Workshop at CVPR 2020 last year. So results on ImageNet. So uh, what we have was, so these are the results here on, on ImageNet in the, in the figure here as a function of the number of classes trained. And you can kind of see that our method did did extremely well. So it's the green, the green line is the one that updates its covariance matrix, whereas the yellow line keeps it static. So it did a little bit better if we kept it plastic. But it did extremely well compared to methods like iCarl, for instance, which which um, uses big batches to update itself rather than using online learning. Um, so this is all done in one single pass through this through the whole data set. Um, and and it achieved the the best top five accuracies here, so it did it did it did win out even against something like end to end here, which is like a variant of iCarl that came out in uh, I believe like ECCV 2019. So so uh, pretty impressive. Consider and it only took 30 minutes to train 900 classes and required just a tiny amount of additional storage, so barely anything. You could easily use this on like a phone or something like that as long as you had your features. Um, we also tested on Core 50. I love this data set because it's one of the few that has uh, video streams that are labeled. So um, like I said, I like to, like to learn on videos. I wish it was, had more classes, but uh, we, we, we used it for this and then we used it to test with and without task labels. And as you end our method, our method was was the best when no task labels were used and still the best when task labels were used. So all we did was like just just uh, during inference, uh, just say, hey, you have to guess the task label and really ours didn't really change in performance, whereas these other methods were very dependent on it and they they shot up, but still there was a significant gap there. 
Uh, some of them, like uh, elastic weight consolidation, I feel like we just need to stop using. Like at this point, it's just a straw man. It's a, it, it's a really cute idea. It's published in PNAS, great, but but you know it's just uh, it's almost always not that good. Um, anyway, so that's that's that. Uh, so this is just a baseline. Basically, what we wanted to do was just say, how well does this work? And then we found that it worked extraordinarily well. Uh, but it has limitations. It doesn't do representation learning. It is dependent on the quality of those features. Um, and 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 it may have a, probably has other problems too. For instance, it it treats every instance the same way, so it doesn't really handle outliers or rarer uh, rarer presentations of a category. For example, in a way where it would have a, a a stronger impact on the loss or something like that it just it's kind of agnostic to that but still their main point was it's very simple replay free extremely fast and outperforms many past methods okay so that was that i'll say a few more words about replay so this is a paper we published in iClear 2018 that uses replay but not just replay so it's a, a caught a fear net based on this paper on um um, I, uh, my student, uh, Ron Kempker, came up with the uh, the name uh, based on this fear uh, fear uh, fear conditioning study, and so he uh, called FearNet. Um, um, and it's a brain inspired online learning system that uses complementary learning systems, and it has three kind of networks in it. It has this uh, one that's that's based on the medial prefrontal cortex for long term storage. It has an episodic memory that that's kind of like a buffer that that fills up, uh, and that for fast learning. And it has a, another network that kind of determines which of these two networks should it use. And so to consolidate, it do, it uses, well, while it's awake, for, for it will then use this BLA thing to determine whether to use, which neural network to use. Does it use its recent stuff in its buffer or does it use its long-term storage? And then it goes to sleep. And when it goes to sleep, it, it, it basically uses both generative replay and replay from this HC network in order to retrain the MPFC network and the BLA network, and then it just erases the HC network entirely. So um, this is a kind of hybrid approach that I think makes a lot of sense. And I haven't seen many other people try to do anything like this by incorporating sleep with downtime. But I think, I mean, downtime makes sense. Every animal sleeps. So there must be something there. I don't know if every animal necessarily uses replay, but, but um, um, we know mammals do it. And we know what happens a lot during sleep. So, but the anyways, the issue is replay shouldn't be the only way to learn, right? This doesn't learn only with replay. The brain doesn't only learn with replay. Um, and and I, I, what I'm trying to do right now is advocate for thinking more about this general approach. Establish a protocol for sleep. Learn without it when the system is active so it learns very quickly. Learn with it with downtime like replay. And uh, but but lastly, vertical replay of raw input doesn't make any sense. Like I, it's like we know our brains don't do this. I mean, there's no way my photoreceptors are are being reactivated at night to to replay experiences throughout the day. It's just not that's not the way it works. Okay, wrap up. I have to thank all my students. So all these students have uh, worked on these projects or are working on follow up work on so on on these projects. Um, and my work has been supported by by many agencies. Uh, so thank you. I, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with replay, but most implementations aren't doing anything like the brain. It's not doing any vertical replay. Uh, papers don't have consistent protocols for even for using it for memory and compute. I can't touch on this, but it's kind of a disaster in the literature. Um, and uh, uh, I think it does make sense to try to minimize the use of replay because it's costly. We showed one approach, SLDA, can learn extremely quickly without replay and achieve a strong results. We're currently working on improving it. So thank you. Sorry, did I did I I went too long, didn't I? <laughs> no, no, no. You 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 have been perfect, perfect on time, and uh, thank you, thank you very much because this was another very insightful talk. Uh, and uh, well, I, I'm seeing um, let's say, let's say a pattern in this um, also with uh, Vincenzo's work because if you it seems to me that if you take away replay you have in some way uh, to to focus on the output layer if you want to be efficient so both vincenzo with cwr and uh, your work in slda um, is something well 
both of you could implement maybe your your work on, on smartphones someone already did and uh, the idea of having uh, the focus on the output layer to me is very um, important because it shows that uh, maybe most of the drift uh, due to, to forgetting is on the really on the classificator so to say so this of course for for classification tasks and uh, this is related also to the pre-trained models and maybe we we can work on on that i think as a, as a community uh, yeah yeah please, please vincenzo oh yeah so uh, related to that i want to ask chris um, a question so uh, also because uh, you mentioned as well that uh, we shouldn't focus on replay uh, from raw input data but that's also related to this uh, issue that if we do not replay from raw data, then there, the representation layers, let's say, they cannot be learned uh, continually, uh, at least for current methods. So do you have um, some insights on how we could do that? And, or, I mean, what you think about uh, not learning them at all? I mean, I don't know what's your position about the feature extractor. If, if, if uh, like, uh, it's reasonable for you to start always with a good representation or fake representation, uh, or you think that we should um, learn continually uh, that uh, that representation and how you would go towards that goal. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I do have thoughts, but no conclusions. So you're absolutely right. So how can we overcome this problem? So so. I mean, I mean, we could just have a different pre-trained network, but let's assume that that no matter where where we get the pre-trained network, that that's not available to us, right? And what are we left with? So, so we could try using random features. There's an old paper by Jan Lacoon prior to the the Grand Awakening, right, saying random features in the CNN work pretty well. Um, um, so, so you could just have like in that Remind paper, for instance. We still did a base in it for half the CNN, and then we could use non-vertical replay, uh, um, basically halfway into the thing. Um, so we, but we never studied whether or not just using intelligently initialized random features, something like that, in those early layers might suffice. But we do know that, like the the human visual cortex, ends up learning like reasonably good features, right? We have we have a, a color opponent. Uh, Gabor like filters there. Yeah. So those are somehow acquired. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I suspect it's not just, I suspect it is at least to to some extent from the natural environment, right? We know, we know like it, they emerge from ICA, it emerges from PCA to, to some extent, and it emerges with when you when you do supervised learning in deep neural networks, you get these same kind of commonalities and filters. So it may be the case that there's some alternative algorithm that could be that could learn in order to bootstrap those initial visual features that would make sense that wouldn't be replay dependent or wouldn't depend on the kind of grading descent approach so there may be some bootstrapping there for the that that those first layers so we can get around the vertical replay and then you could do something like that game we played in 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 remind for training the rest of the network um so i think there's something there i haven't explored it yet but i i'm i'm 100 with you how do we get around how do we train those first layers then and i think it's a really good research question and and i mean i mean there's you could resort to pre-training on some other data set or or doing something else but it still really doesn't get to it but i don't know one thing i like to think about is why do why do children have amnesia or, or why do they have amnesia right for the first couple of years of their life and you know maybe it's just because again a ra rather raw hypothesis uh, maybe it's just because they're having so much perturbation in their early layers of their brain uh, because they're trying to learn those representations that 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 uh, they suffer from severe catastrophic forgetting while they get things sorted out until about age two. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, just just a random thought. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I also agree. agree with your your vision. And hopefully in the future we will be able to to answer or at least to explore this uh, this very interesting uh, field and uh, and topic. So thank you, thank you again, uh, Chris. 
And uh, let's move on to the last speaker, uh, Eden Belluda from uh, University of Paris Saclay, with uh, rehearsal free, of course, plus incremental learning for image classification. Uh, so please go ahead. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yeah, I can see the presentation and uh, hear you well. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Eden Balwada. I'm a PhD student at the Atomic Energy Commission and IMT Atlantic University in France. So today I will be presenting two of our works uh, in class incremental learning uh, without memory. In a general term, continual learning consists of learning from stream of data, where data continue to appear uh, upon the time. Uh, the particularity of class incremental learning is to add multiple classes uh, at once without forgetting the classes that were learned uh, before. In a memoryless setting, uh, no memory of the past images is allowed. Uh, it means that only images of new classes are used to update the model. Uh, some examples of class incremental learning without memory include uh, disease classification where uh, access to past data is not available, is not possible uh, due to privacy issues. We can also find military drones uh, that explore the, uh, this, uh, the, the environment without necessarily having an internal camera to uh, save the images. And finally, we can find um, uh, uh, identification systems where uh, the identities continue to appear uh, at a fast pace. The major problem of class incremental learning, as uh, most of you know, is uh, catastrophic forgetting, is when the neural network tends to forget past data when trying to learn a new one. In this toy example, I present uh, one initial state and two incremental states, where each uh, model uh, in, in a state is initialized with the weights of the previous model. And in each state, uh, we have two new classes that should be included in our model in order to be able to classify not only the past classes, but also the, uh, the new ones. The major cause of catastrophic forgetting is the bias of the model towards new classes in the classification layer. Uh, and this is because there are no images to be replayed for the past uh, classes. And this, uh, the consequence of this is that uh, images of tests that belong to, uh, to past classes uh, will be uh, mistakenly uh, classified as belonging to uh, new classes. Uh, so our first approach, we call it SIW, or standardization of initial weights. It's based on fine-tuning with curse on tropilos. So uh, to understand the effect of catastrophic forgetting in the classification layer, we plot here the mean magnitudes of classifier weights for new and past classes for the ILS VRC dataset with 10 states. Uh, so as we notice here, the mean magnitudes of, uh, of uh, new classes uh, are far uh, larger than those of uh, past classes, as I said, because there are no images to be replayed for the past uh, classes. Uh, this analysis shows the usefulness, uh, the usefulness of uh, initial uh, classifiers of uh, past classes where they were streamed for the first time. Uh, also, we notice that the mean magnitudes of new classes uh, uh, vary across incremental states with uh, global reduction uh, in the in the la in the last uh, states, uh, so uh, this help us also to think about a normalization approach in uh, in order to make the classifiers uh, weight uh, more comparable. Uh, here we plot some weight distribution of random subsets of uh, classifiers, and uh, since the global tendency of the weights uh, distribution follow a normal distribution, we for, uh, we propose to uh, perform a standardization of initial weights after uh, after uh, bringing them after freezing them uh, so to explain uh, more precisely the approach here i i bring back the the toy example of the previous slides for the first batch of classes we we perform a classical learning uh, but for the incremental states what we will do is that we will freeze the the class uh, the classification weights for the past classes through the through the incremental state. It means here, for example, for the first incremental state, I have two, uh, new, uh, two new vector weights for the two new classes. So these uh, two vector weights, I will let them evolve uh, with the feature extractor. However, what will not evolve is the, feature, uh, is the weights vector of the past classes. 
once I pass to the other uh, 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 incremental states, it's the same. I will have four uh, weight vectors that are freezed, uh, and I will let evolve only the feature extractor and the, and the classifier weights of the new classes. So this is the first step of uh, the approach, is to freeze the past uh, weights of uh, uh, the initial weights of the past classes. And the second uh, step, as I said, is to apply standardization of the of these weights by taking each uh, each weight and and subtract from it the mean uh, weight vector and uh, divide it by the standard by, by the standard deviation of the of the weight uh, vector. And after that, we have the the matrix that is uh, that is updated and normalized. Uh, what you will do here uh, in the in the equation three is to recompute the the, the output score by simply multiplying the future uh, vector with the standardized uh, vector, and we add uh, finally the and uh, we add for the past classes a term of uh, calibration. Uh, we call it a statement calibration, and it consists of multiplying the, the prediction score by the a confidence of the model in the current state and divide it by the confidence of in the first state in which the class was learned for the first time. And the confidence of the model, we define it as the mean top one prediction of the images in the uh, in the state. Uh, so this term here uh, has uh, combined the information from uh, different states in order to have uh, most uh, more harmonious uh, uh, scores through the states. So after applying as IW here, uh, we see uh, the, the weights vector more comparable between past and new classes, and the catastrophic forgetting is less severe comparing to a vanilla fine tuning one where uh, no uh, technique of uh, catastrophic forgetting is applied. Uh, the second approach uh, is based on a feature extractor, so it's based on fixed presentation, and we call it diesel or d shallow incremental learning. Uh, so here we apply a standard transfer learning scheme between the uh, states and the classes learned incrementally. So diesel has mainly two parts. The first one is a deep feature extractor or uh, a convolutional neural network that is trained on the first batch of classes. And the second uh, phase uh, that is shallow classifiers of type support vector machines that uh, learn the classes incrementally. So we have each uh, for each class we have one support vector machine. So we learned the first uh, the first deep feature extractor on the first uh, on the initial classes uh, the of the first state. We will use it to extract the features for all the incremental states and and learn one uh, class by. Well, the positives of the SVM will be the features of images of the class that we want to learn, and the negative uh, negatives will be the features of images of other classes belonging to the same uh, batch uh, of classes, uh, the same incremental state, but of from the class that we want uh, to learn. Uh, the the performance of diesel uh, heavily uh, depends Sorry, on. Adam? The uh, uh, yes. Sorry, I think your uh, your slides are blocked at seven out of uh, fourteen. You didn't change them for some reason. Yeah, I think uh, it could be related to the connection issues, maybe, because also the the sound is not clear. Okay. Well, we can hear you, but it's not uh, uh, very so clear. Also, to... also the image coming. Screen sharing. Okay, so I'll stop the camera to. And the well, I'll return and tell me if. Uh, yeah, also the, the, the order is, is getting. Uh... So I will uh, reconnect, okay? Just okay, yeah, no problem, no problem. Well, this is uh, this yeah. is unfortunate, but I mean, um, there there was a question, I guess, uh, right for uh, in in the chat for Christopher, so um, maybe we can uh, wait for the recognition and uh, answer this, this question. Um, so Christopher, are you able to read the chat? Yes, I can 
I can see okay, it. Okay, so there is, okay, can you, can you read the question? Sure, um, okay, I yeah. wanted to ask one question, but I understand, okay, I'll skip that part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no. Uh, mixing data samples with past data that are stored in buffers, that's, that's the core idea of replay, uh, but that's probably not the right way to tackle the problem. Um, partially agree. Uh, I want to know my thoughts on what if we mix incoming data with samples from past tests without storing them in the buffer. You, uh, you mean just uh, just learning like with gradient descent then? Like like there's no buffer, so it's just like standard, I guess standard updating. I mean that was the idea behind LDA or that that streaming LDA algorithm that 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 we had was there would be no buffer. Um, so we could update it, but but then we were then we had no way. To, we were then dependent on those features, though. Um, why is it bad to perform? Such you want me to explain the question, or? Yeah, please. So uh, the, I've seen some methods uh, wherein they use uh, kind of dual architecture uh, to just uh, you know provide uh, data samples from historic tasks without storing them in the buffer. Um, so we yeah, are like what what are your thoughts on oh 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 so like generative replay then is that yeah, what you're yeah. thinking about yeah, oh. yeah. um i i so i i use generative replay in in that fearnet uh algorithm but the the main my main criticism of many generative replay papers is if you're going a lot of them try to argue the following uh that that's a vertical replay, I don't know, they don't, probably don't call it that, I started calling it that, uh, but it isn't, isn't good, so we're gonna do generative replay because that'd be better. But then sometimes their generator is so big that now they have just as many parameters as if they would have used a little buffer. So I think the baseline needs to be a buffer that's at least has the same kind of memory constraints as your, um, as your, um, as your generator uh, for using generative replay. Um, uh, yeah, that's I guess my main my main thought there. So uh, does this answer the question? Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Uh, sorry, Andrea, can you see my screen? Yeah. Sorry, I, so I'll, I'll I'll be taking over from Eden because uh, she has a well. We are supposed to be in this whatever futuristic uh, technological cluster, but the internet connection is crappy since uh, especially since uh, the COVID situation. So. Uh, Okay. At this hour of the day, uh, there are problems. So, uh, she, um, well, she, uh, we, we were left at uh, slide, I think, 9 out of 14. So, uh, speaking about diesel, this is a very simple, uh, I, I would say, the simplest uh, way to, to do some something incremental, uh, where we basically have a, a fixed extractor, as uh, Christopher has, and then we uh, simply learn uh, SVMs, and we store them, and then we, uh, we compare every... Um, uh, every test sample with uh, with all the SVMs, uh, regardless of the, uh, the incremental state. So we have A, B, C, D, whatever uh, number of states uh, in the end. Um, so we've done some quite a lot of experiments because um, there are a lot of um, papers changing quite a lot the <laughs> the experiment, experimental setting, which is in a way understandable since the the renewal of uh, incremental learning or continuous learning is quite uh, well it's quite young it's well it, it became it uh, began like three or four years ago uh, so what we did is that we looked at four data sets here uh, three of them have 1000 classes so this is very important for us because we want to see what's happening at uh, a reasonable scale and one of them is CIFAR, which is 100 classes and it's uh, used basically by uh, by all papers uh, what we also did is that we write a number of um, incremental states, so uh, 10, 20, 50 per, uh, for each data set, and th then we also write uh, the memory. Uh, we have this awfully, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there is no memory here. Um, so we have this awful table where uh, we show some results. So um, the basic method would be uh, learning without forgetting, which was adapted uh, in iCarl and in uh, many other papers, where basically they use distillation to uh, counter uh, um, catastrophic forgetting. And then we tried uh, what Eden said before. So basically we tried to uh, add the initial layer instead of uh, classification layer learned uh, for each class, uh, instead of uh, the, the, the current layer for the past classes. And uh, it kind of works. Well, it works a bit because we have um, uh, better scores. 
Then we also tested uh, Lucy, which is a CVPR uh, 2019 uh, paper uh, without memory. Um, it has quite nice results. Um, and I think we, uh, well, our, our hypothesis is that they have a nice formulation whereby uh, they use distillation plus some other tricks for interclass separation and stuff like this. And um, it has better results than learning without forgetting. Then we have our favorite baseline, which is uh, simple fine tuning. Uh, which is uh, really catastrophic in terms of performance. Uh, and then what we do is that we put, uh, we, we add um, in initial layers, we add some uh, normalization uh, with um, standardization or with um, Euclidean norm, um, Euclidean uh, um, norm, sorry. And uh, we have uh, quite good results there. So the best one would be uh, the um, uh, standardized uh, initial weights. Uh, which so we have an aggregate me measure which is to the right uh, so we go uh, way below uh, what was published before in terms of uh, methods which use um, model update uh, so this is the good news in a way the bad news is that um, our uh, uh, fixed representations of diesel and uh, uh, both diesel and uh, deep uh, SLDA presented by Christopher are much better than any of the <laughs> the methods uh, which use uh, model updates in the memoryless uh, sort of, um, settings. So there is no memory of the past, and um, we are in a way we are annoyed by uh, by this uh, by these results, and we. Well, we're, we're trying. We're, we're trying to uh, to get there, but uh, frankly, we don't know how yet. So, uh, as you see, the, the the last methods, both of them are uh, basically fixed representation. They uh, they are much much better. And then what we also see is that um, if we look uh, to CIFAR, we see that the methods based on the learning without forgetting are better there. So, uh, and the, uh, those based on distillation also, uh, and whereas they are not so good uh, for the um, for the large data sets, um, it's a problem of scale uh, related to distillation. So uh, again, simple appro approaches are annoyingly powerful. Um, what we see is that so from uh, the method which uses uh, which uses uh, initial weights, we see that uh, most of the catastrophic forgetting actually uh, occurs in the um, classification layer, and then the fixed representations seem to be the best choice if, uh, as Christopher also mentioned, the initial feature extractor is trained on a sufficiently, sufficiently large data set. And uh, again, distillation seems to be uh, less useful at large scale. So we have these results for distillations for the um, memoryless uh, setting, and also have that uh, when we use, uh, we use, we use samples. So uh, this is quite puzzling, but then we, we don't have a good explanation of it uh, yet. So that's it from me, thank you. So thank you, thank you, Adrian, for taking over and uh, saving the day. And uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with uh, uh, with your conclusions. And also, uh, there is a confirmation in your results that, uh, as we were saying before, the, the output layer is quite important when you remove replay. So, uh, I mean, this is something to, to consider when uh, uh, the, the environment or the constraints uh, um, does not admit replaying of, of patterns. Um, so there was a question in uh, in the chat, but I think you already answered it while speaking. Uh, the question was uh, uh, why uh, learning without forgetting the the most simple version of it uh, works the best for yes. Cypher, and uh, you said that that was a problem of scale. Um, so. Uh, maybe if you want to to elaborate, uh, just to answer the, the well, question. Actually, we uh, we again uh, <laughs> we we don't have a mathematical background, so we we don't have a um, let's say a reasonable explanation, uh, theoretical explanation. Uh, what we see that uh, what we get uh, of it is that there is a sort of uh, smoothing which becomes too high when there are too many classes uh, with uh, when we use distillation. So we are trying to to have a better explanation, uh, and we have a colleague who well, who has the mathematical background, and he's helping us with that uh, right now. We 
Paul. Hopefully you wait, we'll have it in a few months and then we'll we'll let you know. But uh, it, it, I think it has to do to, with uh, with some smoothing uh, which 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 overtakes uh, the good properties of uh, distillation. And this is in a way it's unfortunate because in all the papers that we saw, uh, distillation uh, the the effect of distillation was evaluated evaluated on uh, on CIFAR. So uh, there are maybe 10 papers where they say, okay, they are right, distillation works. And I've never, I, I didn't see a, uh, a proper evaluation of uh, without distillation uh, at, uh, at scale. So I don't know, maybe I, I missed it, but uh, well, I didn't see it yet. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I didn't see this, uh, uh, this either. And I also saw this effect in, uh, in some of my experiments. So I think the, there should be a reason behind it, and I hope you you will be able to to, well, to find yeah, it. I, I, I hope to because we are like it's frust it's very frustrating. We well we we are on it uh, for two years now, and uh, we basically re-implemented the experiment several times. Other people at uh, people at uh, University of Barcelona re-implemented some of our experiments, and uh, because we, we are okay, uh, we, we said okay, th there should be something wrong with what we did. We didn't find it yet, at least. So. I assume that it's the, the conclusion is valid. Now we have, we have to find the explanation. So, yeah, that's that's research, and yeah, that's exactly. the beauty and uh, the the ugly part uh, mm -hmm. altogether. Uh, so I see an hand raised. Uh, no, no, not anymore. <laughs> it's been uh, yeah that's, again. That's okay, uh, Itesh, have you a question? Yeah. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I wanted to ask like the, the previous question which I asked to Professor Kanan about uh, generative deep play. There was a, a second part to it, which was um, why is it uh, fundamentally wrong to mix previous data with uh, in current incoming samples? And also, uh, if we are doing a replay in any manner uh, in this continuous learning, isn't it like the basic violation of uh, lifelong learning uh, assumption or, or condition that we have, we don't have access to historic data. Aren't we violating that condition? Yeah, yeah, this is a valid question and uh, the, the perfect place. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe the, some of the speakers has something to say uh, about it. I think uh, this is also related to, to particular views of lifelong learning definitions because I mean there is not a strict one so yeah you can store but maybe you can if you store a few few samples and so on so maybe we uh, we open the discussion and see various uh, points of view uh, if someone wants to otherwise I will pick randomly and well, I mean, I think I think it. I mean, the points well take. I mean, it makes sense, you know. That I, th I thought that was why we or why why you guys organized this session, right? It's because it's kind of contrary to at least some of the goals of lifelong learning to have a bunch of storage of old stuff. Um, at least I've always said, you know, you're allowed to store a little bit. What is that? I don't know. Why do we add that definition? Because well, we could do it in replay. And so we're like, I guess we got to add this as like some property of lifelong learning is you're allowed to have a limited capacity buffer. But then the capacity varies radically across papers. So I don't know. What do people think? Do you think we, 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 we shouldn't, lifelong learning, you shouldn't be allowed to store anything? I, I don't know. Continual learning? So one consideration, uh, at least for my view, is that okay uh, you want to store some information well the, the only way you can store information in the brain is encoding to our synapses but in terms of uh, you know computer science it means like the weights of our network so uh, to me it appears like rather natural to think about um uh, replay uh, i mean uh, in terms of generative replay if you want to follow the brain's uh, way of doing things because in the end, uh, replay also in the brain should be like uh, implemented in a way uh, so that the basis for storing information are the synapses, and then you can somehow reactivate some patterns within the brain at some uh, higher abstraction level. So if, if that's um, the, 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 the whole idea that, uh, as you were saying, Itesh, I think that you know, generative replay makes much more sense. Uh, 
and then even uh, allowing ourselves to have a very small uh, place where we can store the actual examples of the past. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't see any other way we, the brain could do this. Um, I mean, how can we store like these uh, activations in the brain if not if not encoded into our synapses? Well, I can add a bit uh, on this because um, I can see that we are focusing uh, on biological plausibility, uh, so to say, of this uh, replay. And this is uh, right, of course, because continual learning is uh, highly uh, focused also on uh, biological plausibility. But uh, I think that also a large part of the community uh, works uh, on continual learning with a different point of view. So uh, they don't care uh, in some sense to, to store uh, patterns because if I have an, in, an application to, to deliver and I have the, the space to, to store some patterns, I will store the patterns okay. because it, yep. it, uh, it helps me. Uh, but I agree that uh, if we look at uh, the biological uh, point of view of this, uh, this rapidly gets more complicated and uh, more also more fruitful because otherwise uh, the, the field would, would, would stuck in, uh, in replay strategies, uh, I think. Yeah, I, uh, I made a, a add on what uh, Chris is saying about uh, the continual learning course. We, we say that we allow to store uh, small buffer why we are saying so um, because if we uh, want to target scalable continual learning model which will fit many many tasks here so far as i uh, said in my um, talk the bench the current benchmark have five tasks or so on but if we want to talk about the realistic scenario where we can encounter larger number of tasks so it would be realistic to limit this buffer, but um, my question now, uh, which samples I should um, store in this buffer? So I guess this is also uh, an important question. So, OK, if I allow to store very few samples for each class, so which samples will be representative for this class that will um, keep the information or the knowledge about this class? So, uh, if if I may add, uh, so I, I I will be in in a way I'll be the the, the devil's advocate. Uh, from my point of view, uh, it's not that useful to ask ourselves whether a replay should be allowed or not. Uh, uh, it should be a matter of if the application, I mean the um, the resources uh, allowed by the application allow for. A, buffer for generative model or whatever uh, we want to to put there and then we should pick I would say we should pick the in, in a um, pragmatic way we should pick the method which works best because I mean if you have no memory basically it's not even worth uh, worthwhile uh, speaking about uh, uh, either generative model or uh, about uh, uh, image buffer or whatever else so Well, OK, um, there is also another end raised. So Aditya, if you want to, to speak. So uh, when, when we were talking about whether like whether some memory should be saved from the features or not. So I was thinking a few days back, like um, like if I talk about the core 50 data set. So if if we can somehow find um, a common image which can represent the a particular class uh, for example if it's a phone then then find a common image uh, by maybe fusing those images in, in some way or finding some statistics from that image and and just keeping that image uh, as a representation um, of that of that class uh, and and this this came from like like I, I was seeing a video in which they were they were juggling the balls and um, if we like when when you juggle and if you see at a point which is not in the center it's difficult to you know juggle but if you see at uh, at a fixed point it's it's easier to juggle so I, I was just trying to like correlate both these things and just thought of sharing. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. If, if anyone has to, to comment on this, has some comments. I mean, it's similar to the idea of keyframes, right? I mean, in, in video processing, you know, people can figure out, you know, what are the kind of like snaps of the video that are like, that are not a goal for a certain second of the video, then you go to the next snap, whatever, like that. So your idea is kind of like similar to, to that. And there are clustering based methods. So my group built a method called Extreme once upon a time. I don't know, we can just see the names. Uh, but but uh, it basically tries to cluster the prototypes, right? So that way you're only keeping a small segment of them based on the similarity to each other, rather than keeping everything. Um, um, yeah, try try to identify the right ones to keep. Yeah, then I, I have also seen like a couple of techniques that are called like data set distillation. So these may be used as well. And the idea is to find like to to, to compress uh, somehow raw uh, data into a smaller number of raw input data. And I've seen like working very well with, um, with many data sets. Uh, but I, know, I don't know uh, to which extent you can do this in terms of uh, dimensionality, but uh, I've seen like reducing the MNIST data set to a couple of images. Um, and then you can retrain, of course, uh, your model based on these images and you can reach the same level of accuracy. So, in a sense, you can find some many different ways, I think, not only to select keyframes, as Chris said, but also to compress uh, raw data if you really want um, to later use them for replay for the R shop. Uh, okay. Yeah, totally. Uh, maybe the, the, the problem here is, for example, if you adopt the, the, the online learning framework, is that to distill a data set, you need uh, to in some sense, uh, to to take a buffer and yeah. accumulate accumulate yeah. it, be, because you have to add it before you can distill it. So, for I guess for some uh, specific uh, uh, scenarios, uh, this approach could work. For others, uh, it may not work. But I mean, that's that's normal. Uh, there is no free lunch. Uh, <laughs> but yes, this is also. A, Distillation is also an interesting approach, and uh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. So there is also a, a link uh, in the in the chat to a uh, to a work uh, with uh, with data set uh, distillation. So great. Uh, okay. So uh, we don't have any more questions, I guess. Uh, no, but. If anyone wants to, to bring to the table um, a topic, please. This is the moment. No? OK, so, so I would just uh, some wrap up by asking to, to the speakers if, if they have any ideas and uh, if they want to share us, with us um, what do you think uh, is the the main tool to learn without replaying? So there is something that guides you when you are going to to think about a, a model which works without replay. For example, we have seen today uh, sparsity or output layer in some sense focusing on uh, on this uh, on this part. Uh, what do you have in mind when you uh, foresee the future of, uh, of replay free approaches? Um, maybe from my side, um, if I um, think about the rehearsal or the replay, I will think about it at the representation level instead of the row level, which uh, is promising in um, two aspects because it somehow may um, simulate what's going on in the brain. So the brain doesn't replay the row images. Uh, and also in terms of uh, computation and memory uh, efficiency, it was an important aspect for me uh, when I provide a continual learning method that will be useful for the real world situation. Yeah, that's true. That's true because uh, um, many works uh, focuses on, OK, I, I don't use replay because I want to be more efficient. For example, I want to, to save computation. So this is uh, um, a use case in which 
uh, regulatory approaches may be also uh, applied in, uh, in practical cases. Yeah. So my, my take on uh, on these, uh, actually, I want to stress the point that I already raised in my presentation. So what I believe is that we can learn a robust representation in an unsupervised way. I mean, we don't know yet how to do that, but my bet is that we can do that. Uh, so uh, I would focus and I will focus in my research on uh, this idea of finding finding good tasks, let's say, in which you can process a lot of information like in visual streams, natural video streams, in which the data itself has a structure that can help you define tasks which are unsupervised and already have inside uh, some uh, replay, essentially. So if we can, for example, let's say uh, predicting ne the next frame in an image. In that case, uh, if the task is, un let's say, unsupervised, uh, you can exploit the data structure in that you know temporal period and stream, and you can learn robust representation uh, that later you can use for continual learning for downstream tasks such as image classification. So uh, all the techniques that we have developed, I think, and you know we presented also today, are all great, and but most of them they work well because we have a, this good representation already for. So my bet is that we, we we need to focus on unsupervised techniques on video streams, for example, that can uh, resolve that. And after that, we I think that we are we will be better off in, in trying to design uh, learning algorithms that can learn continually uh, in even in complex cases like small patches online uh, and um, you know with, with much less supervision and without replay, of course. So Vincenzo, when you say that, right? Are you expecting these features to still be learned in a uh, continual learning manner, right? The, is, is the, is the uh, feature representation learning also continual or now or is that not continual? Because you know that's the hard question, right? Yes, I mean, the reason I why we came up with these algorithms was because we knew that modifying that stuff results in very difficult to address Feature yeah. drift resulting in catch drive forgetting. So let's fiddle around with the outputs where we can have a lot of control and yeah. can prevent this. <laughs> oh, Chris, actually, my, my bet is that we we will not uh, need possibly uh, Taylor uh, and then design new continual learning strategies for the representation layers because I think that uh, in some tasks there are invariances that on the long term, like looking at an infinite uh, data stream, if you learn very slowly, you will find. And so these natural reoccurrences will help us uh, create robust representation because we learn them so slowly over time, like I think our brain does, uh, like over many years uh, of training, you know, uh, when we are babies, uh, we, the, the estimated flow of visual information is in the, is, is the order of magnitude more than what we provide to our learning algorithm. So I think that the I, the bet would be like adding more, much more data, unsupervised data, exploit the structure in the data to learn continually, uh, I mean, maybe even uh, without some specific heuristics to, to take or forgetting, just, you know, uh, possibly also agree to the sand, who knows, but we'll try. So you're saying if we can learn the, yeah, so this is your hypothesis. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to state what I'm, I'm interpreting you to say, but you tell me if yes. I'm wrong. Um, um, you're saying that if we have a good method for mm. learning the representations slowly, yeah. then therefore, all we have to uh, now I'm going to add in stuff that that therefore that you know still if we do that one of these methods that just fiddles around with the outputs would still eventually have be unable to correctly process the feature representations because they've changed, they've drifted, right? So, but presumably if they learn slowly, mm -hmm. all we have to do is figure out some compensa compensatory method in yes. the output method. And that's exactly yeah. what I'm thinking too. Yeah. I just, uh, I haven't tasked anybody to think about it yet in my group, but I'm, <laughs> but, but I, I, I'm thinking about it. I've, I've had it gnawing at me for a while. 
Yeah, so one thing is that, Chris, I think that uh, after a while, these uh, representations are going to be like stable enough. Like we know uh, R, like for example, pre-trained ImageNet features for natural image classification. So if you look at our methods, you actually don't need, if you start from a pre-trained model from ImageNet, you don't actually need to change the low level representation layer because they are great already. And uh, I think that uh, in the end, you, you know, they are going to be pretty much stable. So in that sense, you need like very little compensation in the output layer or in the classification layer to, 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 to do. And uh, so that's push, about. I don't know if other people have comments. I'll push back on that. So, <laughs> so you're absolutely right. I have observed that across many, many tests, of course, where where um, ImageNet features generalize reasonably well, but at least a few. So, so I was leading AI R and D at a computational pathology company. So, computational pathology. These are like giant images that look really weird and we can't process. I can't process them because I'm not a pathologist, right? But they can. Anyways, what I found multiple times was that there was a huge gap if you didn't fine tune that CNN part of the network just because the kinds of patterns were just not captured well by something like ImageNet or either other other related tasks in pathology data. Like there's some, there may be some tasks where the little features just have to be different but maybe that's not true for us humans but i mean pathologists learn how to do that task so unless their their visual features they established very slowly at some point um um just sufficed for it they had to learn additional new things and we do know there is plasticity in v1 right even even late in life yes uh, there's been studies in 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 uh rodents showing that that uh, there's plasticity and reward can modulate it and change 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 the property of those so i think a lot of it can be compensated for like a lot of it should generalize but i i think i think no matter what in our final ultimate true we've solved the problem algorithm we have to uh still learn uh continually features i don't think we can just solve every problem assuming we'll have a totally truly universal features. I don't know. I, I, I yeah, probably would have said exactly what you said to encounter those problems. And yeah. then I saw like huge jumps from like, like, you know, like, for example, one problem, it was like a, a 0.7 AUC way above chance looks great for features. And then but if you train on it, you know, it jumped up to uh, like 0.99. So so, you know, it was it was the case that the feature representation did not suffice. Yeah, well, Chris, I, I agree with you. In fact, I think that that's great even for us because otherwise we would be out of job, you know, continual learning people, uh, if the representation is, is good enough for everything. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, no, it, it, it makes sense. And uh, yeah, I, I, I again, I, I stress on the fact that it should be like slowly fine-tuned. Of course, if you see all the time uh, medical images, uh, maybe it's better to to change a little the, the representation layer so that you have more able to, to, to recognize those and, and uh, as you said uh, the human brain and other uh, biological learning systems they are great at, at this i mean over time the plasticity keeps decreasing but uh, at the same time there is still a bit of uh, flexibility to to change uh, our our representation layers so but, but I don't I mean, want one, to... one possibility is like a hybrid approach right yeah. so if you had you know let's say take sparsity for an example right so you have a bunch of uh, representations that have that are pretty universal for many tasks but then if you still have adequate kind of capacity to learn new representations you just need something like sparsity so those don't interfere with the other ones that are already being used and only used for new tasks where the existing representations didn't suffice or something like that yeah. Well, thank you for this interesting uh, exchange. <laughs> so also Hitesh, I guess, uh, has something to say. Yeah, uh, so I had two more thoughts on this. Uh, we talked about scalability, and uh, I think uh, no network, no current approach would be foolproof. Uh, like one to look at it, uh, like eventually we'll need a network which expands uh, based on incoming data, incoming number of tasks. And the other thought which I recently had in mind, I haven't uh, done research or uh, literature about it, which was about associative uh, learning. 
Uh, I've heard that our brain kind of uh, associates different things with uh, each other, and that way it helps in learning. So if, if we could associate uh, different uh, tasks with each other, uh, maybe maybe will that help in uh, increasing positive transfer and uh, uh, will somehow uh, we, there, there was a, uh, someone mentioned earlier about compressed net uh, while the talk on uh, space net was going on. So uh, maybe will that uh, help in promoting sparsity in the network and uh, uh, improve learning and maybe kind of reduce the need to replay i don't this, this was just a random thought uh, and i wanted to know uh, your opinion if someone has any opinions on this yeah uh, what i see is that um i mean i'm thinking about expanding model uh, which expands in in time or with more tasks um, and as more classes arise uh, Currently, we are building, uh, let's say, dense model, which simply adds new units. But also sparsity here is a way to avoid this while keeping uh, the possibility to learn uh, new tasks, uh, but keeping the same structure. Well, not the same structure, the same uh, capacity, uh, because if I reroute, reroute connections or uh, make them plastic enough, uh, maybe I can avoid to add new neurons because also we, okay, we continually add new neurons during our life. But uh, as we progress in time, we add less and less new, uh, neurons uh, also as uh, adults. So maybe sparsity is something which can uh, keep all these things together, uh, at least in my, in my opinion. Also for task relatedness, which uh, I mean, if the network is sparse, you can measure how much one task um, overlaps with another. If the network is dense, it's much more difficult to do this operation. And so maybe also in this case, you can uh, you can work on that by means uh, by means of sparsity. But but I guess. Uh, so we know our brain. So so there are certain regions of the brain that experience neurogenesis, right? We have the olfactory bulb and the dentate gyrus, right? In the part of the hippocampus, but but at least for for all these areas where we're talking about generalization and all the kind of like exciting things, presumably, I mean, maybe maybe the reason why this this occurs in like the dentate is to do something like replay and store stuff quickly. But um, um, for, I guess so, 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 but, but we know it, 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 at least there's no evidence of it occurring in like the, the you know, the, the neocortex, neocortical areas in, in humans at least, um, or other mammals. So, but one idea is, you know, maybe maybe it's just about distillation, right? And reallocation of units. If you can like compress something efficiently, you can then free up some existing stuff without necessarily having true neurogenesis. You just can reallocate a unit or something like that. I, I don't know how the brain does it. Yeah, I, I have just a few comments more on, on sparsity. So um, Last year, I've been visiting uh, Numenta, which is a company working on brain spar uh, algorithms. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about sparsity and how these uh, impact uh, impact uh, continual learning. And, uh, you know, if uh, we, we really made it possible to learn, as uh, the soccer presentation made it clear, uh, things in a very sparse way, like the brain does, like with um, uh, sparse activations as well as sparse weights, like at the sparsity level that the brain does, then, I mean, uh, we could retain uh, pretty much all the information uh, we, we, we encounter in our, in our uh, data streams. But the problem there is that, and so you don't have to forget because you isolate weights, right? Uh, but the problem there is, is uh, I mean, how you can have a forward transfer of knowledge uh, because um, so if you compartmentalize all the weights then you say that there is no like uh, a common uh, representation like in weights that could be shared um, across different concepts or tasks or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that that's, that's the main question. So do we think that there is a, a, a part of the network that is shared? Um, how much is that? 
And uh, so I think that, that a part of these networks is shared and, and allows for forward transfer of knowledge. And, but in that case, you open yourself up to, to, to forgetting of, of these you know, uh, shared weights. So that, that's the trade-off. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree with you. So uh, we we did some analysis on this. So it is a compromise between uh, how many neurons you will reserve for this task. And um, basically, I mean, um, you want do you want uh, the representation to be fully distributed or semi distributed? And this is a compromise between the catastrophic forgetting and the forward transfer. So yeah, in a space net, for example, we make it as a hyper parameter to reserve some of the neurons so as to allow part of the knowledge to be transferred to future tasks. But um, as I said, uh, one important question, can we figure out the task similarity so as to uh, identify which neurons to reuse or to free for the other yeah. tasks? Yeah, that, then another comment that I would like to make is, uh, yeah, as Chris said, I mean, the represent I mean, it seems like these representations are learned, but there are also evidence that in the brain, you know, some connections are not learned, are just random, right? And yeah. uh, so that's another thing. Maybe the, 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 you know, what we talk about, the representation layers are are made up of a random connections. That case, just sparsity may be enough for, for continual learning. <laughs> In that case, yes, the, the soccer approach is better. <laughs> yeah, also deep randomized networks are, are a thing now in machine learning. So th there is also an entire field into which we can uh, look and uh, in which to take uh, many, many, I guess, hints and uh, research directions uh, if you want to, to look to to fix the sparse or not connections. Yeah, there so, are yeah. many works also on, on semi-random. These, I think, are very, very interesting. Semi-random, uh, uh, you know, networks. Yeah. Uh, they can work well, so that, that's something very interesting. I have to hop off, but thank you so much. This is a, a really fun, exciting discussion. I, I thank you for inviting me. This is fun. Thank you for, uh, for being here. Okay. And I guess we can we can wrap up uh, and thank you, Chris, again. Uh, and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo. Uh, thank you, Welcome. Gada. Thank you, Eden. And also, Adrian, for taking over at the end. So if you want to, to stay in touch with us, please join uh, Continual AI. We have a Slack channel. We have many open source projects. Uh, so if you want to, to work with us and you are interested about continual learning, please feel free to, to contact us. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. This has yeah. been a, a very great, great, great meetup. And uh, see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye-bye.